I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. This is Scripture Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, the first and second epistles of Peter. This is a real treat to get the words of Peter, the chief apostle, the one who was next to the Savior in so many of those incredible stories that we read back in the Gospels, and quite frankly, the one who seemed to get the most corrective feedback from the Savior, the one who was uh, constantly doing things and then finding out after, oh, I probably should have done that a little differently, but he kept taking it meekly, humbly, and because of that, the Lord kept giving that instructive feedback and he grew and became this incredible apostle from that first uh, miracle on the fishing boat back on Luke 5, in Luke 5, until we get to hear this first and second general epistle of Peter, where you see him speaking in very beautiful language. In fact, Joseph Smith said that Peter penned the most sublime language of any of the apostles. That's a pretty high praise coming from Joseph Smith. Sublime language is a, is a good description of what we get here. So let's begin by talking about his audience. And you get that in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If you, if you unpack a couple of these words for a moment, you'll notice strangers. These are people who are not in their homeland. They're exiles. They're, they're refugees, if you will. They, they're, they're displaced saints. They feel out of sorts. Now, we could stop there and move on. Or we could say, hmm, I wonder, I wonder if there's some uh, symbolic instructive element going on here that all saints of God through the ages to one degree or another are strangers where that heavenly element is now in a worldly environment surrounded by people encouraging you to do things that that spirit inside of you finds very foreign and doesn't want to do i wonder if we could take the writings of First and Second Peter a little more personally than maybe we have in the past, and say, hmm, even though I don't live in those exact locations listed in verse 1, we are all strangers in a, in a symbolic sense as disciples of Jesus Christ in this particular world. This is a very powerful word that all of us at some point in our lives feels this way. We feel out of place that perhaps we are in the wrong crowd or in the wrong location. Sometimes even in life, we're like, how long will this life last, this, this suffering, this enduring, where I'm separated, I'm a stranger from God. And so we can see this symbolically. And so Peter is addressing people who were essentially resident aliens or foreigners living in the Roman Empire who did not have full privileges, didn't have full freedom. They were living in the land of the Roman Empire, but they themselves Many of them apparently were not full Roman citizens. And because of that, because that they were different, there was a lot of persecution, a lot of problems that they experienced because the larger culture did not welcome them fully and fully embrace them into the, into the Roman world. You know, building on that, if, if you look at what we're, what we're going to study today in First and Second Peter, Look at the overarching power and significance of agency. This idea of an independent agent. Each person has this capacity to decide for themselves what they're going to think, what they're going to say, what they're going to do, how they're going to live their life. And you have heavenly influences. You have adversarial influences acting on them from below, and then you have just traditional natural influences in the world around them working on them, trying to push that individual one direction or, or encourage them to move one direction or another. So sometimes people feel like in the gospel that it's too constraining, it's too controlling, 
consider that everywhere you go in life, everyone you meet, every organization you interact with, everything you, you engage with on the internet is trying to affect your agency in one direction or another. So don't be surprised when you go to church and you're being told what to do, how to do it, and how to better be a disciple of Christ. That is what church is supposed to do, is help us understand how to best use our agency. It would be a terrible thing if we went to church and were just told, do whatever you want to do, because whatever we want to do as natural, fallen, carnal, sensual, devilish people in this particular world, we're going to naturally gravitate downward. So what a privilege it is when you get a book like this, where you're going to see Peter reaching out to these people who are being dragged down. They're being persecuted. They're being uh, exiled because they aren't worshiping the idols of these cities, of this Roman Empire, of this pagan uh, system that has been set up. So they're seen as the outcasts. They're going to experience all kinds of of persecution. And you'll watch as we progress through these epistles how many times Peter foreshadows the, the terrible persecutions that they are going to face, that they are already facing, but more specifically that they will face in the future. Interesting. Is not that one of the roles of the prophet? is to stand as a watchman on the tower and see things that are afar off and warn people in the present day to prepare them for what is to come. What a privilege it is to have prophets, seers, and revelators on the earth with, with us today. But it doesn't do us much good to have them on the earth if we don't listen to them, if we don't pay attention to what they're saying and actually believe what they're saying because we're too busy listening to the voices of the world. So watch for that theme as we go through these two books today. And let's jump into verse 2. And here's what Peter continues on. We've talked about being a stranger, but yet, even though you might feel like you're different, God elects us, or he's chosen us. Verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Isn't that, I, I love the fact that he used that word elect. It's the Greek word eklektos, which means chosen. It means the favorite the one who is elected. Now, that's really odd because here's Peter, the chief apostle, writing to these people who in verse 1, he called them strangers. You're these exiles. And then in verse 2, it's as if you're not citizens, but in verse 2, he then calls them the elect. You're the ones who are elected. You're the favorite. You're the chosen ones. Well, I have a question for you. Who voted for them? Who voted for you? The election was held and you were elected. Who did the electing? Who did the voting? And I think the best answer is God and his son Jesus Christ did the electing and they voted for you. Now, as an independent agent, God put all of that vote, all of that trust, all of that election into me now the question that remains is, am I willing to vote for him, to elect him as the, the primary leader in my life and to follow him and to take the, the rulings or the judgment or the law that comes from he who is elected? It's this beautiful interplay back and forth that long before God asked me and you to have faith in him, he clearly put all of his faith and trust in us. And it's, it's just this beautiful interplay to be able to love him because he first loved us. Peter then builds on that. That election means we are blessed. We see that uh, then turning back to God. Verse 3. In fact, verses 3 to 12 in the original Greek are a, a long, extended, single sentence. Actually, a very beautiful, long uh, extension 
of this idea of God's blessedness. We'll just read verse 3 here just to give you a sense of what Peter's trying to redirect their thinking about. Despite all that you're experiencing and suffering, let's remember what is true about God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy. Interesting, of all the qualities you could talk about, we're going to focus on mercy. Which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So can you see the significance of the fact that you and I were born into a corruptible body in a corruptible world, a, a very corruptible environment and culture, and he's, Peter's now using this beautiful comparison to a lively hope that is now born in us when we are reborn because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we get this new birth. It's a new life in Christ, but we're still living in the corruptible environment. The environment has not changed. The changing is not external. The change has come internally. In our, in our very being, not in just who we are, but in who we're growing to become now. Look what he says in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible. You usually get inheritance from parents. Well, what is the new parent that we've uh, been adopted by in this spiritual rebirth process of becoming a part of this covenant people, this elect group, this chosen group? It's Jesus Christ who becomes the, the symbolic father of that spiritual rebirth. So we now have an inheritance through him. And it's an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And it fadeth not away, and it's reserved in heaven for you. Now, consider his first century audience who are under intense persecution from without, Here's Peter, the chief apostle, reminding them, endure it well. Jesus Christ endured infinite external persecution. He endured it perfectly. And if you'll follow his example as his adopted uh, child in the covenant, then you have this beautiful uh, inheritance reserved in heaven for you. And he goes on to say, look at verse 6 wherein ye get greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through many folds temptations. Or trials or challenges. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, because it's not just, it's not just what the devil is tempting me to do. It's, it's physical mortal life. It's hard at times. Physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, there are all these things that go on that make it make it really difficult as an independent agent to want to move forward with hope or with faith. And I love how scriptures and prophets can give us those little infusions of, of belief and encouragement and motivation to keep getting up and keep putting one faith-filled footstep in front of the other and moving forward on that covenant path even though it sometimes feels like all is lost. Well, we get this in verse 7, this, this drive to encourage the saints to keep pressing forward and to put into context the understanding of what it means when you suffer and struggle and deal a challenge. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So whenever you are suffering or struggling, just put it into context. All of that will refine you and make you more precious than gold when God comes to collect his treasure. And we are that treasure. In fact, we hear Peter talking about being the precious treasure uh, that he quotes from, from the Old Testament. Yeah, which, which by the way, I, I don't know about you, but that, that's not really the message I want to hear as a natural man. The, the, the natural part of me doesn't want to hear, if you'll be good, if you'll just be a good boy and keep the commandments, then you're going to be okay through these fiery trials, through these many-fold trials and temptations that are going to come your way, through all the persecutions. Through, I don't want to hear that. The natural 
part of me wants to hear, look, if I keep the commandments, then God's going to make my life easy, and all of my trials and tribulations are going to go away. All of my children are going to perfectly believe everything and follow the covenant path forever. There's going to be no setbacks. That's what I want to hear. But that's not what I get in Scripture. And that wasn't the story of Jesus Christ's life, and it doesn't seem to be the story of any of his prophets' life or any of these good examples through the history of time, or even for that matter, in our day today. You look at our leaders, none of them have had a life of just absolute peace and prosperity and ease. They have all come through fiery trials of one degree or another and been refined through that process. So you see Peter giving these illusions of, of future struggles and wrestles. Don't be, don't be frustrated with God when bad things happen to good people, which now brings us to verse 8. And, and I, would, I would preempt verse 8 with a question by saying, how do you actually come to know somebody whom you have never met in person, you've never had a conversation with in this life, um, you've only heard stories about them, you've read things about them, how do you really come to know them better in that with those constraints. Look at verse 8. Whom, having not seen, we're speaking of us in relation to Jesus Christ, and in this context, Peter's talking to people who are scattered about who never had the opportunity to meet the Lord Jesus Christ like Peter did. He says, but you haven't seen him, but ye love him in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls." I love this idea that if I want to get to know the Lord better, I have his words, I have many of his deeds recorded before me, I get to know him better by loving him more, trusting him more, and trying to emulate his example more every single day. That's how I come to know him, is as his image becomes engraven upon my countenance, as he shapes my use of agency to more fully be in accordance to his will. I, I'd propose that your first views of the Savior will come as reflections in a mirror rather than in a visitation from him. He will help you become more like him as an adopted child in the covenant that he offers us. And to provide more encouragement to these saints scattered abroad, he moves on in verses 18 and 19 and says, For as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, so he's basically calling out the Greco-Roman pagan world, those things aren't saving you. What has to save you? What is the source of the joy in your hope? Verse 19 but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot." And then he closes this first chapter with this beautiful um, analogy. Look at verse 22. "...seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren." See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then he does this, so this comparison is everybody understands human birth and, and this newness of life, this new baby that's born. And now he's making this comparison to this rebirth process that Jesus Christ offers each of us. And then the comparison continues in verse 24 when he says, for all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. Well, guess what happens with grass? It withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. The most beautiful grass in its season will eventually come into the fall and into the winter of its cycle and die. But he's making the comparison now in verse 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which, or which by the gospel is preached unto you. 
everything the world offers us is of the world. It's of flesh. It's, it, it's corruptible. It has a clock ticking when it will expire. But the things that come to our spirits, to our souls from heaven, they're incorruptible and they are living water. They're the living stone. It's the living bread, the bread of life. It's all of these symbols that point us back to Jesus Christ, which is this permanence, this eternal perspective. One of the things I love about Peter is his love for Scripture. And there are more than 20 references to the Old Testament that Peter has packed into this epistle. And we'll just call out one here. We'll probably talk about others. But if you turn to Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8, you will see that it has been replicated here in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. Now, there's some interesting, significant things about why Peter has chosen this portion of Isaiah to support his message to these struggling saints. Now, the book of Isaiah is a very long book, 66 chapters. And it turns out the first 39 chapters, you might summarize it as God's expression of the consequences that happen when people don't stay faithful to him. And it turns out those first 39 chapters of Isaiah, lots of beautiful things, but there's also quite a bit of dis, uh, dis, discussion of destruction or challenge or suffering. And chapter 40 is the trophy chapter of Isaiah. What I mean by that is trophies in the ancient world, uh, when you were in battle, if you started winning, the army that you're beating would drop all their weapons and their gear and run. And so trophy literally means the turning point. And so if you're the winning army, you be able to collect all the gear that the other army left behind, and you would show them as symbols that you have won the battle. And it's the turning point when the other army turns and run, runs. Isaiah 40 is a turning point. It's a trophy moment where God is now focusing on the joy and the blessings and the future possibilities of his kingdom. And if you look at chapters 40 to 66 in Isaiah, they're all about the comfort, the salvation of God. That is the key emphasis. And chapter 40 is the foundation for the rest of that portion, that rest of Isaiah. And it's interesting that Peter knows this and he calls out the most significant chapter in Isaiah for highlighting God's comfort that with God, even though we live in a world, a fallen world of difficulty, God's comfort is there, and we can also have our turning moments where we can collect the trophies of salvation that God has given us. So to, to build on that, in chapter 2, he launches into quoting another of these Old Testament passages from Isaiah chapter 28. If, if you look at verse 6, he's, he's talking about this chief cornerstone that the builders are going to reject, but it becomes the chief cornerstone. Well, that's the same verse that he and John had quoted to the Sanhedrin back in Acts chapter 3 and 4, when you had that experience of him helping that lame man at the gate of the temple be healed, and that caused 5,000 people to believe and, and to start following that, that group. So here he's using that same scripture again, which focuses on Christ being the chief cornerstone. But brothers and sisters, a building doesn't consist of just the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone is the most important part of the construction process, to be sure, no question. But the point of laying a chief cornerstone is then to be able to build on that solid foundation and that starting point the rest of the house, the rest of the building. Well, what is that? That's where you and I come in. So in, in all of our speaking of Christ and rejoicing in Christ and prophesying of Christ, to use 2 Nephi 25, the point of that is to bring as many people as possible into that family of Christ, into that structure that we're building. Let's look at verse 8. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So he sets us into this construction metaphor or analogy to say, if we're not careful, just like the chief priests stumbled 
over the stone that becomes the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ himself. The point is, let's not get too prideful ourselves and pat ourselves on the back and say, well, at least we weren't that bad. If we're not careful, we're going to do the same thing that the chief priest did, just not with the living Christ himself, but with his teachings. We're going to stumble at his word. We're going to stumble at the directions we receive from heaven, at the, the law, the, the commandments that he gives us, the directions he gives us through his prophets, seers and revelators, and through the Holy Ghost. And so then he follows it up with one of the sweetest uh, verses in all of Peter's writings, in, and probably in all of the New Testament itself. Look at verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people. Many of you would hear that and think to yourself, should I be offended? Peter called me a peculiar people. Usually the word peculiar means odd, weird, out of the ordinary, which quite frankly fits. But if you look in, in the footnote at uh, 9f, it tells you that the Greek word here means purchased, preserved. And the Hebrew word means special possession or property. It's not odd in the peculiar way that we use that word today, or, or really strange and weird. It's this special possession, this purchased, preserved thing. And what was it purchased by? By Jesus Christ through his infinite suffering, his blood that was shed for us, his life that was given for us. We are a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So again, Peter, who's just a master with the scriptures in the Old Testament in particular, he is quoting Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 to 6. Let's just give the context again. If you want to talk about the origin story for the Israelites, their founding moment, it is being brought out of bondage from Egypt by these glorious signs and powers and manifestations from God. He leads them out in the wilderness. He leads them out of darkness with the light, his pillar of light. Notice we human that have that here in Peter uh, uh, verse 9. What's interesting about Exodus chapter 19 is that this is the time when God is preparing the people to receive his covenant instruction at Mount Sinai. In fact, we get the Ten Commandments, the very next chapter in Exodus chapter 20. But God is trying to lay out in advance who he is and who they are. He's trying to define who the covenantal parties are. He wants them to understand why they're being invited into this covenant relationship with the divine king. He's trying to say, as a divine king, you are my peculiar or special treasure that has been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. You might remember that they had to slaughter lambs at Passover so that the destroying angel would not affect their homes. And Peter is calling upon this memory. It's called an illusion. And listeners to this could go back into the scriptures and say, man, there's so much that Peter is packing into his message with just one little reference. And so the invitation for us is, we are still in that covenant relationship. God has not changed. He has not broken the covenant. The covenant is alive and well. It is still available for us. And we still are the peculiar treasure. Even if we feel like we're strangers, we are still the chosen treasure. And I love how he, he takes that now. And by the way, as Taylor's mentioned, he knows his scriptures and, and they're just part of his, part of his flow of thought. He's using their words. And so he goes straight from this idea from Exodus. And then in verse 10, he jumps straight into this covenantal language from the book of Hosea. You, you in essence, get the entire story of the first few chapters of Hosea in verse 10 and 11, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You've gone from the, the flesh, the world, the, the culture that you're born into, to now the eternal, the heavenly, the, the divine grace of Jesus Christ, where you are his people and you have obtained mercy. And then verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims 
these resident aliens, these sojourners in a foreign land, abstain from fleshy lusts which war against the soul. So there's a powerful lesson in here for us today to, to consider their situation back then, these, these strangers, who these pilgrims living in this land where the world sets up all of these things to try to turn our attention away from God and away from his prophets and away from, from true wisdom. And it's often done in the form of things that are, are enticing or amusements. Now, Taylor's talked about this word before. It's powerful, amusements. Yeah, so at the base of the word amusement is the word muse. And in Greek, there was this idea that the muses were those who, um, it was their role to capture people's attention. Now, it could be for good. Like the word museum is based on the same word, or even the word music, right? It can be very soothing to the soul. It also can be very distracting. And so amusement means you're in the process or state of being distracted or pulled into your attention, drawn away from something, and the muse is drawing in you into focusing on something else. So again, a museum, it tends to focus your attention on some theme, object, or idea. Music attends intends to get your attention on one core thing. Again, amusement, amusement isn't always a negative thing, but if we're not careful about how our attention is drawn away, we might lose one of the most powerful resources we all have in common, and that is our attention. And how we spend our attention is what we receive in life. And if we allow amusements that we do not carefully choose and control, our attention will be diverted from things that will may be uplifting. So we should be using our agency to allow God's muse, his music, his, his museum of truth to draw us in our attention to him versus the amusements of the world. Which all of those amusements of the world generally play upon the fleshy lusts which war against the soul the way he describes that in verse 11. Now, if you jump over to verse 19, it says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. It's praiseworthy if somebody suffers grief wrongfully. That's a wonderful thing. And then he asks a follow-up question. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? In other words, if I break the law and then get punished by the law and I take it well, he's saying, well, yeah, you should take it well. You broke the law. But he's talking to a whole group of people who more often than not are being punished for things that they didn't deserve to be punished for. But based on the world's judgment, that, that punishment is being meted out. Look at the last part. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. But I think one of the underlying messages of that concept in verse 19 and 20 is, endure all punishment and all suffering to the best of your ability, and whether you deserve it or not. I think that's, that's kind of implied in all of here. But then he ties it in to the perfect example of Jesus Christ. And he even sets that up in verse 20, 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And by the way, Christ suffered for us, not because he deserved even a single particle of that suffering. He deserved zero suffering, and instead he received infinite suffering, and he endured it well. So he, once again, is the great exemplar here. And then he finishes down um, with examples of, of how Christ did that and bore our sins. And he finishes with verse 25, For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. The overseer. Beautiful words here. Now we jump into chapter 3. Let's skip over to verse 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit 
a blessing. Once again, you could read verse 8 and 9 and think, oh, those are good principles. Those are good concepts. No, they're way better than just good principles and concepts. What Peter's doing and what our prophets do when they teach anything for us to, to work on or to do in our life, all they're doing, if you pull back all the layers of symbolism at the core, is they're teaching about the character, the perfections, the attributes of Jesus Christ. They're inviting us to become more like Christ. That's all verse 8 and 9 was, or 10. It's showing you what Jesus the Savior did and what we're now in, invited to emulate and work with him on becoming. And for context, again, Peter is trying to address Christians living in their, their state of exile in the Roman Empire, feeling persecuted and maligned, and often seen as the other. In fact, the Romans often wanted to say that the Christians were the cause of all the negative things happening in the empire. And unfortunately, it was the leader of the Roman Empire, Nero, who often was modeling for other Romans how to cause problems for Christians and claim that, well, they're different than us. And so any problems we're having, natural disasters or otherwise, well, it must be the cause of the Christians. But Peter, wanting these Christians to endure well, uses a bunch of examples from the Old Testament to talk about people in situations that perhaps were not the ideal, but they endured. They were patient. They sought after good. And that's what Tyler has summarized here in verses 8 and 9, that even if you're in an unfair, unjust situation, your job as a Christian follower of Jesus is not to fix it by using the world ways of railing and slandering and lying and thieving and hurting, but choosing to endure and to use the processes of the gospel to help yourself and to others to be aligned with God and to bring peace to the world. So he, he finishes this up, this concept. Look at verse 14. But, and if ye suffer for righteousness sake, happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Again, are you seeing all of the foreshadowing? Peter keeps bringing it up again and again and again. Basically, you're going to go through some pretty significant struggles and trials and tribulations and temptations and difficulties, but don't let go of your covenant connection with Jesus Christ. Don't get off of that covenant path because mists of darkness or because pointing fingers or because strange roads are amusing or forbidden paths look really alluring. You keep moving forward in that covenant connection with Christ. And then he gives this beautiful statement in verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Stop treating God's words, God's directions, and his, his commandments as if they're on an equal par with the things that the world is telling you you should do, and at times even demanding that you should do. But in your heart, sanctify the Lord God, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Can you see this in the first century context? Can you see how these saints might be approached by other people in that Greco-Roman world and culture and say, I don't get you people. Why don't you come to the city uh, offering to our idol? Why don't you participate in the sacrifices, in the pagan worship? I, I don't, why are you willing to endure all of this incredible persecution instead of just joining with us? And Peter's saying, be ready always to give an answer, which is fascinating because sometimes if we're not careful, we can over apply a principle of the scripture and the over application of this particular idea would be to then engage in Bible bash or arguing or, or contending with anger with people who are contending with us over points of doctrine or over scriptural interpretation. So I love the fact that he's saying, be ready to give an answer. Don't fight. Don't mm -hmm. contend. One of my favorite quotes on this topic that has been used by multiple prophets and apostles through uh, the last uh, couple decades comes from the author Austin Farr in his book about the life of C.S. Lewis. Listen to this quote. 
Though argument does not create conviction, lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend is quickly abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. I love that concept that you, you, because you give somebody an answer doesn't mean they're going to then ask you to be baptized. But if somebody asks us questions and we, our answer is always, I don't know, that's good enough for me. If that's always our go-to answer, eventually it becomes very difficult for people to form any kind of faith in what we're trying to teach them. So verse 15 is a powerful invitation. Now let's consider three of the accusations Romans shouted at the Christians about. Now imagine you're an early Christian and here's what people are saying about what you believe. I want to ask, before I tell you what these three things are, ask yourself, have you ever had people challenge you and claim that you believe things that are odd or weird? And you had to explain with clarity and give reasons for your belief as Tyler's been talking about. First, Romans thought that Christians were atheists. That means without God. Well, how would Romans get to that conclusion? because Christians did not go worship in the public arena of all the different gods. And so if they didn't worship the Roman gods, the Romans thought, well, clearly you don't have a God, so that makes you atheist. And of course, the response is actually, we do worship God. We worship Jesus Christ. Second, the Romans claimed that Christians were cannibals. Now that one sounds really odd till you realize that Christians every week celebrate the consumption, the eating of the body of Jesus Christ and the drinking of his blood. Now, most of us aren't bothered by those phrases because we know the symbolism and the beauty of what it means. We are not literally consuming Jesus Christ in the cannibalistic way. But for the Romans who didn't understand, they claimed that Christians were cannibals. And then finally, Christians often would speak to one another in loving terms and say, I love you, brother. I love you, sister. The Romans claimed that the Christians were being incestuous. Now, what happens is even in our day, people don't always take the time to understand what we believe truthfully about Jesus Christ. And just like the ancient Christians who had to respond here in verse 15 with meekness and respect, the word fear would be better translated as reverence or respect. We also shouldn't take offense when people misunderstand our beliefs, but we can declare with humility, meekness, and respect the truth of our beliefs, and not simply to say, I believe, but give people a reason for why we believe in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. That's beautiful. Now you look at verse 18. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. So, so the perfect suffered for the imperfect, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. These are, can you see why the prophet Joseph Smith said that Peter penned the most sublime words of any of the apostles? These are beautiful concepts. Look at verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. Then once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. And then he compares it to baptism. It's that section right there that the prophet Joseph F. Smith was pondering before General Conference, that October General Conference, when he, as he pondered and he meditated upon this, this concept and wondered, how, how could the Savior have gone into spirit prison and preached everything in such a short period of time when the eyes of his understanding were opened and he saw the great vision of the, the spirit world and the afterlife that is now recorded in Doctrine and Covenants section 138. It's beautiful. You could cross-reference uh, verse 19 to Doctrine and Covenants section 138 in your scriptures and go and dive deep into what uh, the prophet Joseph F. Smith saw and then was able to share in general conference that next day. So as we jump into chapter 4, consider the the 
struggle that comes when a person changes their life, when they actually make major life adjustments. He says in verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So, there was a time when all of these people, before these Christian missionaries met them, when they fit right in with the crowd. They were doing everything that the Romans, uh, Roman people were doing at that time. And now, look at verse 4, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. They're saying, you, you've changed, you don't come with us to all of these same festivals and feasts and sacrifices that you used to come. You used to be one of us and you're not anymore. What's wrong with you? What's changed? And I love that he, he says, verse 5, who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. He's, he's saying the ultimate person you need to answer to. Now, this is an important concept both individually and collectively, because we live in a world that tries to point fingers of scorn, fingers of accusation at you individually, as well as at the church collectively, and tries to hold you accountable for why you're not doing what they're doing or why you're doing things differently. And the reality is you only stand accountable to one person, and it is the judge of both quick and dead. And the word quick means alive. Alive. So, he is the one to whom we need to be able to give the ultimate accounting for why we're doing. And you can be ready to give an answer to these people, but you don't have to prove your case to them. You don't have to convince them that what you're doing is right. Ultimately, the only person we stand accountable to individually, as well as as a church, because there are a lot of accusations laid at the feet of the church, ultimately the only one that we stand at the, the judgment seat of is Jesus Christ, the judge of all. So this has been a very well-known verse in the church, verse 6. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. So this is really one of the strongest references we have in the New Testament about the opportunity those who have died without knowing the truth will have an opportunity to hear it again. And the logic here, or the truth, is what we get from verse 5, that your job is simply to declare the truth, and God himself will judge the living and the dead. And God has to then demonstrate through Peter how the dead will have the opportunity to also know what is true. And then after doing all of this teaching to these people who are struggling currently and who have many fiery trials in front of them, look at verse 8. And above all things, sounds pretty summative, pretty uh, mountain peak teaching here, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You stop and think about that. Um, charity is the pure love of Christ. So, in the ultimate sense, it's the pure love of Jesus Christ that covereth a multitude of all sins. We get that. We understand that. But the point of Scripture isn't just to celebrate Jesus' perfection. It's to celebrate the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is willing to share his perfection with little old me, that he's willing to teach me how to love more the way he loves, how to have charity govern my thoughts, my, my words, my actions more than ever before so that I can become like him. And in the process, that extension of charity covereth a multitude of sins. And you, you'll notice there that he doesn't say whose sins. I love the fact that your charity can not only cover, the, the Lord can use your charity, your, the, the love of Christ that's in you to cover multitudes of your sins, but also to help cover multitudes of sins of other people who feel discouraged, who feel dejected, who feel a lack of hope, like, I'll never be good enough. What an amazing thing it is to watch somebody with the gift of charity interact with somebody who is in the depths of despair and see them walk away 
feeling the light and the love of God again. And in the process, a multitude of their sins just got covered. And if you look at the footnote, Joseph Smith changed one word in that verse. He changed the word cover to prevent. So charity prevent, preventeth, or we would say prevents a multitude of sins. I love both of these readings. I love Joseph, the prophet Joseph's inspired uh, adjustment there because what an amazing thing it is when we extend charity, we prevent future and further sins from occurring. But also the way the King James translators rendered it, it points us backward in time, covering a multitude of sins. And I like putting both of them together rather than uh, having to pick one or the other. Yeah, all truth will be circumscribed into one great whole. Now let's jump down to verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. We've said this before, he is preparing them for trials. And for many of these particular saints, they are going to literally pass through fiery trials. Mm -hmm. Nero, as referred to before, one of his preferred methods of, of persecuting and trying to just squelch this, this rising Christian movement is to burn the, the Christian saints. And so here's Peter using this phrase concerning fiery trials. I think that's more than just flowery words. I think it's literal foreshadowing for what many of them are going to face in the future. And some of you are probably thinking to yourself, well, then why in the world are they finding the ability to stay when there's so much intense persecution from without? Brothers and sisters, I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe that the external pressures of the world are ever the ones that cause us to lose our faith or lose our covenant connection to Christ. The external storms, if you let them, will actually cause you to hold on tighter to your covenants, to progress even more. It's only when we let the external storms become internal doubts and internal fear where we shrink back in our heart, in our mind, in our soul, when we choose internally to let our agency now focus more on the amusements of the world or the pulls and the tugs of the world or the temptations of the devil, rather than on the, the invitations, the commandments, the directions, the love of God, that's when we start to disengage. That's when we let go of our covenant connection with Christ. It's not the external fiery trials. It's the internal uh, battles that we start uh, intentionally giving up on. That's when we start to let go. So Peter builds upon this saying, you need to be prepared for trials. In fact, you should expect that God will challenge you first. If he has elected you and chosen you, he's also going to refine you. Verse 17, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begun at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Meaning, expect to be challenged, expect trials, and let that be a witness to you that God knows you and he's helping you to become more like him. So he finishes this first general epistle in chapter five with some beautiful instructions to the elders, the leaders of the, the group in, in these different areas. And then he comes down to verse six. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. The idea that you, you are going to have to pass through these fiery trials, but God will exalt you in due time. Verse 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Have you ever stopped to think about it in this context? He careth for you. If I cast upon him all my care, then he's the one who cares. Let's modify that word for a minute. Then he will carry 
my burdens for me. Have you ever had that experience where you're in a situation in a setting where there's all this pressure to perform or to do something or to accomplish something and you feel the, the level of stress rising and maybe it gets to a level that you might call anxiety where you're feeling so much pressure and it, it actually causes you to not perform very well. It's almost paralyzing in its effect. This would be a verse that could help us in that moment of need. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Brothers and sisters, in those moments of struggle, if we can do a better job of instead of thinking, I, all by myself, have to do this. I have to figure this out. Instead, if we can say, oh Lord, I need thee. Please help me with this. The power of the Savior to come and help us carry those burdens and to lift those cares with us and for us. It's very real and it's powerful. Now, this isn't to say that if you do that every single time, it's a matter of pushing buttons and it'll always be easier. That, that isn't the case for everybody. The point here is if I call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and I turn to him, whatever my situation in life is going to be, it will be better than if I don't turn to him. It, but the solution might not be as instantaneous as you would hope, and it may not be as complete as you had, had presupposed. But the point is we keep turning to him and trusting in his knowledge, his power, and his goodness. And we, we let him carry those burdens with us for as long as that is necessary. And he concludes this encouragement in verses 10 and 11 before then he gives the final salutation of who wrote the letter. It says in verse 10, But the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion, forever and ever. Amen. A great encouragement after he's laid out the reality that, yes, life is hard and don't expect it to be a bed of roses, which by the way, doesn't make a lot of sense because roses have thorns. <laughs> yes, never really do. want to sleep on a bed of roses. It may smell good, but it may not always feel good. Yeah. So I love how Peter concludes with this truthful, this truthful support that Jesus himself he is with us, and through him, we can have the support that we need as we seek to glorify him. Which now brings us to the second epistle general of Peter. This would be closer to his death, near the end of his life. And it is so sweet, some of these concepts that he shares with us. He, he introduces his audience as those, in verse 1, who have obtained like or similar precious faith with us. And how did you attain that precious faith? Through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I love that, that he puts, he puts the focus back on God and on Jesus Christ. And then he, he gives you in verse 2 and 3 this, this beautiful, grace-filled, peace peace-filled intro. And then in verse 4, he says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This is super interesting because in the Greco-Roman world, there wasn't a sense that if you worship the gods, you'd become like them. The idea was you wanted to petition these gods to protect you from some problem or give you some kind of blessing. This is really revolutionary doctrine in that world. Now, we, we know this. We've all grown up with this. But in the Greco-Roman world, the idea that you could become like one of the gods was extremely rare. The only people who became like the gods might be a former emperor who has died and the Roman Senate votes divine honors to, say, Augustus or to Caesar. Regular people never could become like the gods. And here we are told we, through Jesus, get to participate in the divine nature. And so how do we experience and express the divine nature? We'll get to these in just a minute, but verses five, six, and seven lay out some of the core qualities of what it means 
to participate in the divine nature. So the, the Greek word for divine nature is phusis. And if you look this, this up in, in Strong's Concordance or in some other uh, Greek lexicon or dictionary, you'll see that phusis means growth by germination or expansion. By extension, a genus. It's, it's of the same sort. It's its native dis disposition. Now stop and think about that in the context of what Taylor just, just taught in a Greco-Roman world. It's this idea of you're of the same genus. You have the capacity to grow and to become through germination. You, you, you begin slowly and it doesn't look much like what it's going to end up being, but it just keeps growing and developing. You get to partake of the divine nature as the, these attributes and these characteristics grow inside of you. And as Taylor said, verse 5, 6, and 7, they show you some of those progression waypoints, how you actually fully become fully developed in that divine nature that has been planted as a seed in our soul from our beloved heavenly parents. So he concludes this in verse 8 by saying, for if these things be in you, the things that were listed in 5, 6, and 7, these things that help you grow and develop, if they be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I love that object lesson of us growing into this full fruitful production, a, a tree of life growing within us that Christ has planted and nurtured and watched over and pruned and grafted and all of these experiences of life have caused us to become fruitful. And then he, he says, verse 10, wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, ye shall never fall. There, there was a time when this concept of calling an election sure, making your calling and election sure, it was a really hot topic, and it, it became a gospel unto itself, where we had people who started focusing more on making their calling and election sure than they focused on God and what the living prophets were telling them, and they looked beyond the mark. It's beautiful if you can keep scriptures in their context. Making your calling and election sure, stop and think about that. Who called you? God. Who elected you? God. So you've been called of God, you've been elected of God, and through the Savior Jesus Christ, we can make that calling and that election from God, we can make it sure. We can make it so that it's ratified, that it becomes perfect. Every time we go to the temple, we go to, if you go to do an endowment, you walk through a symbolic progression from a fallen state to an exalted state. But it's just a symbolic walkthrough. We need to live in the covenant with Christ in such a way that that symbolic walkthrough becomes a reality. It becomes sure. That we don't just walk into a room called a celestial room, but we actually go and abide in the presence of God. In, in the celestial kingdom of our God. Have you noticed how amazing it is that this whole time we have been talking about the struggles, the trials, the fiery trials, the tribulations, the temptations that these first century Christian saints are facing and how Peter, the chief apostle, is encouraging them. He's writing to them to shore up their faith and to motivate them to move forward on that covenant path. But we haven't spent any time talking about what Peter's gone through or will shortly go through. The reality is, is Peter isn't sitting in an ivory tower telling people down on the front lines how, how they should just be faithful and strong in the face of adversity. The reality is, is Peter is on the front line of that battle. He is taking more persecution than most of the people. Look at verse 14 knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. <laughs> Do you see how Peter has become more like Christ in that the Savior foreshadowed Peter's future death 
and future struggles and wrestles so that he wouldn't be uh, blown over by those, by those setbacks or those difficulties. And now he's doing that for these people. Knowing what Peter has faced and will shortly face, the fact that these words are coming from his pen at that time in that setting makes these words really more powerful. And when we go to general conference and we listen to the leaders, those, those inspired brothers and sisters that God has called to lead us in the, these latter days, and when we recognize the fact that none of them are exempt from the, the struggles and the trials and the tribulations and the cares of the world, it makes their messages more powerful to me to not see them as sanitized messages, but as refined uh, discourses coming from the lives, the very lives that these people are living, and the very life that Peter has lived and will let yet live really enhances his message for me as I read scriptures. Hence, the need to keep reminding ourselves of what the context, what the setting of these scriptures are before we really try to wrestle with the content itself. So several things are happening. We saw this in the writings of Paul, that other Christian preachers or other people are coming into the Christian communities and trying to convince people of other ways of seeing the gospel or false ideas. Peter has a particular problem with these corrupt teachers in the sense that some of these corrupt teachers are claiming that the freedom that they learn from Paul, the freedom we get through Jesus Christ, means I can do anything and Christ saves me. And some of these people are living very lascivious lives. And Peter calls them out and says, this is not okay. You have misunderstood Paul. Peter acknowledges, yes, Paul sometimes is hard to understand, but let me give you clarity. Paul was not teaching the liberty of Jesus Christ, meaning you could do whatever you want without consequence. What Taylor's talking about here is a powerful counter weight or counterbalance in the gospel, because if we're not careful, we'll put so much emphasis on God's mercy and love and, and, and goodness and compassion that we almost create a God that will teach you, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die and it will be well with you because I love you so much. And I love that you're pointing out that God also is a God of justice and judgment, not just a God of mercy and love. And these examples that Peter's using, that you mentioned from the Old Testament, you've got verse 4, where he's mentioning the angels in heaven that are cast down. Verse 5, you get the, the whole world destroyed at the flood of Noah. And verse 7, you get Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah from verse 6 and 7. In all these cases, the, the people who have the negative consequences had consistently and purposely rejected God and his servants. It wasn't just like, what? I had no warning at all. They were told. And Peter is now telling his community, you have to watch out for these false teachers who are living corruptible lives. They are twisting the gospel and perverting it so they can live however they want and get the money and the prestige of being Christian preachers. Avoid them, stay aligned to God, and listen to the voice of truth. So look at verse 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and reserve the unjust unto the days of judgment to be punished. Again, we're agents. We get to choose. We're, we're free to decide how to live and what we're going to tune our ear to and look at and which directions we're going to go in life. But we are not free to pick the, the outcome or the consequences. The, the old object lesson of you pick up one end of the stick, you you automatically affect the consequence. The other end of that stick is alive and well here. And he finishes this second letter in chapter three with these final uh, exhortations, um, reminders. And he's, I, I love what he does in verse eight because he sets this beautiful perspective, the difference between the world's expertise versus the knowledge and the perfection of God's uh, uh, wisdom. And the reason he does this is because there are people who are complaining like, well, Jesus hasn't returned again. So clearly I'm not going to be a Christian because this guy that you claim to worship is not keeping his promises. We see that in the first couple of verses. And Peter's trying to explain there's a difference between our limited worldly perspective 
and God's divine chronology. So he says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day to us. Basically, he, he's doing this comparison of a thousand earthly years is as one day. Now, I don't think there's a, a celestial calendar up on the wall of heaven that is exactly one day compared to our exact 1,000 years. He's, he's using this analogy. It's as a thousand years. He's trying to prove a point that you and I who wear wristwatches and have clock calendars on our walls, we, we measure time very differently. We see progression of time in a very different context than God does. And it's this invitation for us to trust God in his timing. We've shared this before, but uh, Elder Neil A. Maxwell said something along the lines of, isn't it strange how you and I who wear wristwatches try to counsel he who governs cosmic clocks when it comes to matters of timing in our life? How many times have we been frustrated when we haven't gotten what we wanted when we wanted it? versus letting go, casting that burden at the feet of the Lord and letting him care for us and say, I'll carry this burden with thee as long as you require. My belief is that for the faithful, for the, the disciples of Christ that are on the covenant path doing the best they can to love the Lord as imperfect as it may be, that God will not let you suffer one moment longer than is absolutely necessary in order to refine the gold that is in you or that is you. That that, that suffering or that, that difficulty or even that persecution, it can serve this beautiful refining purpose, but God doesn't want you to suffer just for suffering's sake. And so if we take that perspective of that pain you're enduring, whether it be mental or physical or relational, it, it can have a divine, beautifully purifying outcome if we keep our focus fixed on the Savior. And now to finish, um, let's go back to the end of 2 Peter chapter 1 and notice how he, he builds this uh, understanding of his role as the chief apostle at that time, right before his death, shortly before he, he was killed for the sake of Christ. Verse 16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Were there a few cunningly devised fables in the first century Greco-Roman world? Yeah, and people were claiming that the apostles were making up the story about Jesus for their own personal benefit. Treating it as if it were the Iliad or one of Homer's fantastical mm -hmm. fables or myths, mm -hmm. the, the mythos. He says, we're not following these cunningly devised fables, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, which happened both at his baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount, that mount of transfiguration. And we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. You'll notice Joseph Smith made a couple of changes in verse 19 and 20. The change in 20 is, no prophecy of the scripture is given of any private will of man. In other words, man doesn't will it, and then God says, okay, fine, we'll change the truth to match what you want. Truth is truth, and God is willing to reveal that truth. And yes, you can get truth from a variety of sources, but the most important truths, the truths that have to do with the, the welfare of our eternal souls is going to be given through the channels that the Lord himself set up, not the will of men that they set up. Just because you get a, a million people to agree with you doesn't make it true. Truth is revealed through the Holy Ghost to you as well as specifically to his chosen servants.
the prophets, these eyewitnesses of his majesty. And then he finishes uh, chapter one by saying, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We often do say we thank thee, O God, for a prophet to guide us in these latter days. I also thank the Lord for prophets who guided people in the past, that their words can still influence us, guiding us, helping us to see God more fully and more clearly. We hope that as you engage in scripture study, you can feel afresh and anew God's love for you, his mercy, his desire to be in covenantal relationship with you, that you might have joy in this life and joy everlasting. We leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. And spread light and goodness. Mm -hmm.